Scholastic Audio presents Goosebumps Horrorland 5 Dr. Maniac vs. Robbie Schwartz Read for you by Mark Thompson Chapter 1 Ouch! I swatted a mosquito on my neck. Too late. I could feel a trickle of warm blood under my fingers. My hiking boots sank into the muddy ground. I heard a rustling sound in the bushes. Probably a killer coyote getting ready to bite my throat out. How much do I enjoy these family camping trips? How much would I like to have all my teeth pulled out by a crazed orangutan with rusty pliers? Robbie, try to keep up, my dad called as he led the way along the trail. Yeah, Robbie, my brother Sam shouted. Try to keep up. He hates camping too, but he pretends he likes it. That's because he's the middle kid, so he has to try harder. Stop copying dad, I shouted. Stop copying dad, Sam repeated like a stupid parrot. Give me a break, I moaned. Give me a break, Sam echoed. Give me a break, my sister Taylor whined. Mom and Dad laughed. She's seven. They think everything Taylor does is the cutest. They even laugh when she burps. When Sam and I have a burping contest at the dinner table, Mom always gets angry and makes us stop. How fair is that? Whoa! I let out a cry as my foot caught on a fallen tree limb. I lost my balance, stumbled, and fell into the mud. My backpack landed hard on top of me. I heard Sam and Taylor laugh. It isn't funny, Mom said. She says that a lot. She's the only one in our family who isn't a total joker. Sure it's funny, Sam said. Robbie is a super klutz. Super klutz, super klutz, Taylor chanted. She did a crazy dance around Mom and Dad. Dad set down the tent and helped pull me to my feet. Hey, a new superhero for your comic strip. He said, Super Klutz, he trips and falls on the bad guys. I rolled my eyes. Ha ha, I said. See me laughing? How funny are you? Not. My family always gives me lame ideas for my comic strip. I just ignore them. They don't have a clue how serious I am about my strip. Dad tugged my backpack onto my shoulders. Then he rubbed his hand through my hair and messed it up. My hair is light brown, almost blonde, and I wear it long and wild. I just sweep it back with my hand. I never brush it. I have a lot of hair. It doesn't even fit under a baseball cap. I think that's why Dad is always messing it up, because he's as bald as a bowling ball. A few weeks ago, I drew a comic character for my strip who looked like Dad. I called him Pinkhead. I never showed that one to Dad. He's kind of sensitive about having a big pink egg for a head. I'm the only one who's blonde and pale in my family. Sam and Taylor both have raven black hair and deep dark eyes, like Mom. They're both short, and Sam is a chubster. He hates it when I poke his belly and tell him it's just baby fat. The sun slid behind some clouds. The woods grew darker. Dad pointed up ahead. Let's set up camp by those tall trees, he said. There's grass there. It should be less muddy. I brushed a swarm of gnats out of my face. What's the point of gnats, anyway? I mean, do we really need them? I don't think so. We found a nice clear space under the trees. Then we set to work putting up the two tents. Mom and Dad started to unpack the sleeping bags. Dad took a long drink from a water bottle. Then he spit a gusher of water at me. I ducked out of the way. Nice try, I shouted. Mom gave Dad a shove. Norman, give Robbie a break. Do it again, Dad, Sam shouted. Dad laughed. <laughs> hey, Robbie, who taught you how to do the perfect water spit? I did, right? Huh? The spritz master. I rolled my eyes. Why can't anyone in this family ever be serious? Mom asked. I pulled out my laptop and sat down on my backpack. I balanced it on my knees and booted it up. After a few minutes, I called to Dad. I'm trying to upload my comic strip, but there's no network out here. How am I supposed to get online? Why don't you try to enjoy the woods instead? Mom asked. 
This is a camping trip. Put that away. I groaned. It's so boring out here. Nothing but nature, nature, nature. Dad grinned at me. Your mom and I like nature. Fresh air, the great outdoors. You're both weird, I said. He pointed to the trees. You promised not to grumble, remember? The sun is going down. Go help your brother gather firewood. I grumbled some more. Then I put away the laptop and trudged into the woods to help Sam. I really wanted to work on my new comic strip. I've been drawing comics since I was seven, but my new supervillain is my best one ever. Dr. Maniac. The totally mental maniac of mayhem. Awesome, right? I tripped again and banged my shoulder against a tree trunk. Leaves shook and shivered above my head. A chipmunk stood up and stared at me. Then it scurried into the woods. Dr. Maniac versus Chipmunk Boy. That might work. Dr. Maniac forces a boy to eat a poisoned acorn, and he grows into a giant chipmunk. Dr. Maniac decides to turn a thousand boys into chipmunks. I can't help it. I get these great story ideas everywhere I go, even in the woods. I stopped and glanced around. Where was the path? I was walking over a thick blanket of sticks and dead leaves. The tall trees blocked out the sun. How far had I walked? I have a terrible sense of direction. I get lost in my own bedroom. Hey, Sam! I cut my hands around my mouth and shouted, Sam, are you here? No answer. Hey, Sam! I shouted louder. Where are you? A bird cawed loudly somewhere in the forest. Then I heard footsteps behind me. I spun around and gasped as a figure stepped out from behind two trees. No, it can't be, I stammered. Y you're, you're not real. I made you up. A grin spread over Dr. Maniac's face. Yes, Dr. Maniac. The comic villain I created. He walked up to me with that crazy grin on his face. He brushed back his leopard skin cape. I'll show you how real I am. He shouted. Eat this dead squirrel. He raised his yellow gloved hands. He held a decaying dead squirrel. Its eyes had sunk deep into its head. Patches of fur had fallen off its back. Eat it! Dr. Maniac shouted. I tried to move away, but I backed right into a wide tree trunk. You're crazy! I cried. Dr. Maniac shook his head. I'm not crazy. I'm a maniac! He bumped me with his chest. It had a big gold M on it. Now, eat it! He demanded. Eat it! And he shoved the putrid dead squirrel into my face! Chapter 2 Hope I didn't confuse you. That last chapter was just a comic strip I drew. Sam and I were sitting in the back of our SUV. We hadn't gone camping yet. We were on our way. Dad was driving the whole family to the woods. I was showing Sam my newest Dr. Maniac strip on my laptop. What do you think? I asked. The dead squirrel thing is good, right? Do you like it when Dr. Maniac shoves the disgusting squirrel corpse right in my face? Yeah, pretty cool, Sam said, staring at the screen. But one thing I don't get, who's the chubby little shrimp who goes camping with our family? <laughs> That's you, I said. Sam punched my arm. No way I look like that, he said. Ever look in a mirror, I said. Ever take drawing lessons, he shot back. I'm almost as tall as you are. Trees whirred past us as Dad roared down the highway. He couldn't wait to get there. Mom and Dad love camping, and they drag us with them almost every weekend. The only thing I like about camping is that it gives me new ideas for my Dr. Maniac strip. Farms with grassy green fields rolled past. Taylor sat in the middle seat, clapping her hands to music from the radio. 
Mom kept pointing out every cow and horse, but no one paid any attention. Sam read my comic strip again. What if you go picking up firewood in the woods today and Dr. Maniac really does show up? He asked. Robbie, Mom called from the front seat. I hope you'll put the laptop away and help out this time. You always make Sam and Taylor do all the work. Yeah, join the family for once, Taylor said. She turned around and stuck her tongue out at me. Her tongue was bright purple from the candy she was eating. Attack of the Purple Tongue. Good name for a comic, I thought. What if a boy is at the dentist's office? The dentist messes up and the boy's tongue falls out. The tongue starts to grow. It's very angry. It doesn't like being outside the mouth. The tongue attacks. <gasps> Look at those sheep, Mom said, pointing out her window. Are you two boys enjoying the beautiful scenery? Sam, what do you think I should do next? I asked. Should I eat the disgusting, gross squirrel? Or should I try to escape? I can't decide which is cooler. Maybe both, Sam replied. He doesn't like writing stories. He is a total game freak. He spends hour after hour playing battle chess. What a weirdo. I like Dr. Maniac's costume, Sam said. He dresses like a total maniac. Red and blue tights with a gold M on his chest, yellow gloves, white boots with yellow feathers all over them, and a leopard skin cape? That's insane! Yeah, he's a crazed nutcase, I said. You're the nutcase, Taylor chimed in. Why don't you draw a comic called Robbie Schwartz, the maniac older geek brother? I reached over the seat and bopped her gently on the head. She screamed. Can't we talk about anything else? Mom said. Look at those interesting shrubs over there. Interesting shrubs? Sam and I burst out laughing. Good one, Mom, I said. Dad turned off the highway. We bounced along a gravel road until we came to a small, muddy parking lot. I stepped out the door into bright sunlight. The air smelled fresh and sweet. Two big red hawks glided round and round a grove of tall evergreen trees. I packed my laptop carefully into my backpack. Taylor jumped out of the car. She ran up to me and stomped down hard on my sneaker. Ow! Why'd you do that? I asked. She shrugged. No reason. I limped back to the SUV. Time to unload our stuff. We always take two tents, sleeping bags, cooking equipment, and lots of sweaters and extra clothes. We loaded up like pack animals and lugged everything into the woods. Not my favorite part of camping. Actually, I don't have a favorite part of camping. But what can you do when your parents are total outdoor freaks? We always follow the same dirt path through the trees. And after about 20 minutes, we came to a nice grassy clearing. Time to set up the tents and build a fire before the sun went down. I guess you want me to go find firewood, I said to Dad once the tents were set up. We all have our jobs, Dad said. Oh, yeah? I said. What's Taylor's job? Being cute, Dad said. Taylor stuck her tongue out again, still purple, real cute. I set my pack with my laptop inside it down carefully at the back of my tent. Then I wandered across the tall grass to the trees to search for sticks and logs. The air grew cooler as I stepped deeper into the shade. The wind blew my long hair around my face. A black and orange butterfly fluttered in front of me, as if it were leading the way. Wow, I thought. Here I am, alone in the woods, picking up firewood just like in my comic. This is the exact scene where I call to Sam and he doesn't answer. And then Dr. Maniac pops out from behind the trees. And suddenly, I heard the bushes rustle, the scrape of footsteps moving toward me, fast. <gasps> Dr. Maniac, I gasped. Chapter three. No. Not Dr. Maniac. I stared as Sam stepped forward, his arms filled with twigs and sticks for kindling. Robbie, what's your problem? He asked. 
You, you scared me, I stammered. I pushed my hair away from my face with both hands. I thought it was Dr. Maniac, I said. You know, like in my comic strip? Sam squinted at me. Don't get weird, he said. Don't start mixing up comics and real life. My heart had been racing. It slowly returned to normal. Hey, Sam, I said. Can you imagine what a messed up place this would be if superheroes and villains were real? And they were always flying around in tights and capes? We both laughed. It was kind of a funny idea. I bent down and started to pick some twigs up off the ground. Sam had his arms full. He stood over me, watching. Robbie, he said. How come you made your main character a villain? Why not make him a superhero instead? I just think villains are a lot more interesting, I said. A loud crackle from the bushes behind me made me jump. The twigs flew from my hands. What was that? Sam laughed. A squirrel, probably, or a raccoon. We're in the woods, remember? Animals live in the woods. Just joking, I lied. I was trying to scare you. I bent down to pick up the sticks I dropped, and suddenly my eyes went wide, and I let out a startled cry. No! I screamed. It's impossible! Chapter 4 Nice try, Sam said, but you didn't scare me. Try again. N no you don't understand, I stammered. I'm not joking. Look! A strip of cloth was caught on a tree branch. I pulled it off and held it up for Sam to see. His dark eyes bulged. Leopard skin? He said in a whisper. Leopard skin, I said. Just like Dr. Maniac's cape. That's stupid, Sam said. What's that doing here? I stuffed the strip of cloth into my jeans pocket. I don't know, I said, but I'm going to find out. I didn't tell mom or dad about the leopard skin cloth. They probably would think that I put it there. My family is always playing jokes on one another, so sometimes it's hard to know what to believe and what not to believe. We made a big campfire and cooked dinner on it. We all roasted hot dogs, except for mom. She doesn't eat meat, so she grilled two soy burgers for herself. They look kind of green and gross, but she said anything tastes good cooked on a fire, especially if you drown it in ketchup. After dinner, we goofed around. Dad told some really lame jokes. My favorite was about a boy who has a banana in his ear. Someone asks him, why do you have a banana in your ear? And the boy answers, I can't hear you. I have a banana in my ear. It's probably an old joke. But I never heard it before, and it cracked me up. Taylor tried to make up some knock-knock jokes, but they didn't make any sense. Sam and I had to beg her to stop. The moon floated low over the trees when we crawled into our tents to sleep. The night air was growing colder. Taylor, Sam, and I were jammed into one tent. I snuggled deep into my sleeping bag. I tried to pull it up over my head, but it was too short. I shut my eyes, ready for sleep. In the sleeping bag next to me, Taylor sang softly to herself. Shut up, I whispered. How am I supposed to fall asleep? You know I like to sing, she replied. It's the only way I can go to sleep. She's such a little freak. That's not the only weird thing she does. She also sleeps with her eyes wide open. Is that disturbing or what? I rolled over and turned my back to her. Outside the tent, I heard the hoot, hoot of an owl. A gust of wind rattled the whole tent. I shut my eyes tight and tried to clear my mind, not think about anything at all. I drifted off for a short while, but something woke me up. I sat up, blinking. My heart was pounding. Someone was walking outside the tent. I heard a low cough, the soft thud of footsteps on the ground. Did I hear someone calling my name? With a shiver, I pulled myself out of the sleeping bag. Sam and Taylor were asleep. Taylor made little whistling sounds with each breath. I climbed to my knees and poked my head out of the tent. The pale yellow moon glowed high in the sky. 
A dark line of clouds, like a snake, cut it in half. Clouds covered the stars. The air felt heavy and damp. The footsteps were coming from the trees. I heard a voice speaking rapidly. What was it saying? I was half asleep, not thinking clearly. I pulled on my sneakers and crept out of the tent in my pajamas. Maybe I was sleepwalking or something. I don't know, but I left our tents behind and walked across the clearing to the trees. I followed the sounds into the woods. I had to know who was there and why he was calling my name. It has to be Dad, I suddenly realized. There was no one else camping near us. Of course, Dad, playing one of his dumb tricks. I stopped in the shadows in front of the trees and froze when I saw a figure slither out. Moving quickly, he slid toward me. Dad? I called, my voice high and shrill. Then I saw the cape, the leopard skin cape, flutter in the wind. Dr. Maniac stepped into the moonlight. And he was carrying a dead squirrel. Chapter 5 You're real? I said. My voice came out in a choked whisper. It's impossible. Eat this dead squirrel, Dr. Maniac said. His eyes bugged out. He grinned from ear to ear. His voice was low, from deep in his chest. The gold M on his shirt glowed in the moonlight. This is crazy, I said. You don't exist. I made you up. Eat the squirrel, Robbie, he repeated. He raised the decaying squirrel in both hands. Stop stalling. I want to see how brave you are. Me? Brave? I choked out. Are you crazy? I'm not crazy. I'm a maniac! He boomed. Eat it! Eat the squirrel! He shoved it into my face. Ugh! The sour smell poured into my nostrils. The squirrel fur was bristly and hard and scratched my cheeks. My stomach lurched. I started to gag. Go ahead, Dr. Maniac said. Show me how brave you are. Are you the brave one, or is it your brother, Sam? Sam, you're crazy. No way, I screamed. I staggered back, away from the sick smell, away from the hard, bristly body pressing against my skin. I rubbed my nose. I wiped my face with both hands, trying to rub away the horrible feeling of the dead creature. Then I raised my eyes to Dr. Maniac. He held the squirrel in one hand and brushed his cape back with the other. He stared hard at me, studying me. Okay, he murmured. Okay, okay, okay. I guess I'm the brave one. He raised the dead squirrel to his face and chomped into its belly. Then he stood staring at me, chewing, chewing loudly, chewing the dead meat. He took another big bite and chewed some more. He made a loud gulp as he swallowed the rotten squirrel flesh. Not bad, he said. If you ignore the taste and the smell. He held it out to me. It was mostly bones now. Most of the meat had been chewed away. Want to try some? I saved you the head. The best part. I grabbed my stomach. Ooh. I started to barf. Somehow I forced it back down. I'm going to be sick, I murmured. No time for that, Robbie boy, he said. You're coming with me. He tossed the squirrel into the trees. Huh? What are you saying? I gasped. My stomach heaved. You failed the bravery test, but you're coming with me, he said. 
You're going to help me destroy my enemy, the Purple Rage. My mouth dropped open. Now I know you're crazy, I exclaimed. The Purple Rage is the angriest supervillain in history. He screams so hard, even his breath is deadly. Dr. Maniac shrugged his powerful shoulders. So, tell me something I don't know. Well, what can I do to help you? I asked. You'll see, Dr. Maniac said. Then he grabbed my arm and spun me around. He squeezed his strong hands over my shoulders and started to drag me away. No! Let go! Let go of me! I wailed. Let go of me! Somebody help! Chapter 6 Sam squinted at the screen as he read the newest comic strip on my laptop. Cool episode, he said. Then he laughed. Robbie, when Dr. Maniac grabs you, you look like a frightened gig. Our friend Brooke nodded her head. You got that right, she said. I could feel your fear, Robbie. Your drawing gets better and better. It was Sunday afternoon. The three of us were upstairs in my room. We were huddled around my desk so I could show off the newest Dr. Maniac strip. Yes, you probably figured out that the adventure in the woods wasn't real. It was just another comic strip. Brooke brushed back her straight brown hair. She wears it very short, with bangs across her forehead. Brooke is tiny and thin. She looks like a first grader, even though she's 11. Sam's age. She has sparkly blue eyes and a little turned-up nose. Kids at school call her Elf, which she hates. She lives across the street. We have all been friends since I was four, and they were three. Where did you get the idea for the Purple Rage? She asked. I shrugged. Don't know. I guess I was in an angry mood. So I made up a new villain. I love villains. That's why I put so many of them in my comic strips. I pulled out my big sketchbook and turned to my first drawings of the Purple Rage. I always do dozens of sketches of my characters in colored pencil before I scan in my finished art. See? I held up some early sketches. At first, I made his cheeks bright red. You know, to show how angry he was. But then I thought maybe that wasn't enough. I flipped the page to show them the next drawings. These showed the purple rage in full costume, shaking a big purple gloved fist in front of him. See? He's dressed all in purple. I said. Purple cape, purple tights. He's always in a total rage, so his whole face is bright red. And then, when he gets really mad, it turns purple. That's awesome, Sam said. He grabbed the sketchbook out of my hands. Do you have sketches of me in here? I grabbed it back. Why would I do sketches of you? I asked. I already know what you look like. I hate the way you draw me. Sam groaned. I look like a turtle. Then grow a few inches, I said, and I'll draw you like a tall turtle. Brooke didn't laugh. Short people can be superheroes too, she said. I tucked the sketchbook back onto its shelf. For sure, I said. I'll put you in the strip, Brooke. Wonder Elf, I'll draw you standing under a toadstool. I thought that was funny, but Brooke didn't laugh. Instead, she grabbed my hair with both hands and pulled as hard as she could. I let out a screech. Wonder Elf defeats the mutant from the hair planet, Brooke cried. She pumped her fists in the air. I tried to smooth my hair, but it didn't go down. It bounced right back up. How was your family camping trip? Brooke asked. You just got back, right? It was okay, I said. You know, lots of nature and stuff. Boring, Sam groaned. He sat down at my laptop and started tapping away at the keyboard. Hey, what are you doing? I asked. My computer crashed, he said. Brooke and I want to play battle chess. Fine, I said. No problem. Just use mine. Don't ask her anything. Thanks, Sam said, typing away. Brooke pulled up a chair beside him and sat down. The opening game screen appeared. Bold music and floating chess pieces, all carrying guns. Sam and Brooke have to be the only two kids in America who play this game. I hurried downstairs. I could see Mom and Dad through the front window. 
They were on their knees planting seeds in the flower garden by the driveway. They sure love being outdoors. I walked into the kitchen and pulled a bag of nacho chips from the cabinet. I grabbed a can of Coke from the fridge and started to the den to see if any good movies were on cable. I was about to drop onto the couch when I heard a noise upstairs. A loud crash. And then a high scream of horror. Brooke's scream. The Coke can fell from my hand and rolled across the den rug. I tossed the nacho chips onto the couch and took off running. I bolted up the stairs and ran down the hall to my room. Brooke, what's wrong? I cried. What happened? Someone had slid the bedroom window wide open. The curtains were blowing out. Brooke stood by the window with both hands pressed against her face. Her eyes were wide with fright. What happened? I repeated. What was that crash? S Sam, she stammered. She pointed to the open window. Robbie, Sam is gone. Chapter 7 A few minutes later, Mom and Dad were staring at Brooke, shaking their heads. Their hands were still dirty from the garden. Dad had a wide dirt smear across his sweaty forehead. I am telling the truth, Brooke screamed. Would I make something like this up? Dad waved both hands in front of him. Shh, calm down, everybody, calm down. Did you call 911? Mom asked. She folded her arms around her chest. I could see how scared she was. Her chin was trembling. Yes, the police are on their way, Dad said. I sat next to Brooke on my bed. I kept staring at the open window. Brooke's story rolled through my mind again and again. Dad wiped his forehead with his shirt sleeve. Tell us again, he said to Brooke. Start at the beginning. Think hard, Brooke. Tell us what really happened. I already told you what really happened, Brooke insisted. Her voice cracked. She was breathing hard. But how can we believe, Mom started. Brooke interrupted. I swear, she cried. She raised her right hand as if she were taking an oath. Tell us again, Dad said softly. Brooke took a deep breath. Then she started talking in a trembling voice. Sam and I were playing battle chess on Robbie's laptop. We heard a noise at the window. We turned around, and Dr. Maniac flew into the room. Still hugging herself, Mom squinted hard at Brooke. Dr. Maniac? Robbie's comic character? You're telling us a comic character flew in the window? Brooke swallowed hard. Yes! He landed right in front of us. He grabbed Sam and pulled him off his chair. I, I tried to save him, but I wasn't fast enough. Dr. Maniac dragged him across the room, and then he flew out the window with him. Brooke started to sob. Her whole body shuddered. Dad stepped forward and patted her shoulder to calm her. His hand left a round dirt smear on her sleeve. Okay, okay, he whispered. Mom started pacing back and forth. Brooke, Robbie made up Dr. Maniac, she said. He's a comic strip character. You do realize he isn't real. Brooke let out a sob. She wiped her wet cheeks with her hands. I know you don't believe me, she choked out. But he was real. He was here, and, and he took Sam with him. But Brooke, that's impossible, Mom said. She leaned over Brooke. Don't be afraid to tell us what really happened. Tell us the truth. Whoa, wait! I cried. My heart skipped a beat. I stared at something on the floor in front of the open window. I jumped off the bed, crossed the room, and picked it up. Two feathers. Two yellow feathers. Mom, Dad, I shouted. I held up the feathers. Dr. Maniac has yellow feathers on his boots, I said. They both stared at the feathers. Brooke jumped off the bed, strode over to me, and took the feathers from my hand. I told you, she whispered. I told you. Mom opened her mouth to say something, but a noise downstairs stopped her. Loud thuds on the front door. Police! A deep voice shouted. Police! Please, open the door. 
We found your son. Chapter 8 Oh, thank goodness, Mom cried. They found him! Dad exclaimed. The four of us went running to the bedroom door. We made a traffic jam of arms and legs as we all tried to squeeze out the door at the same time. Mom and Dad practically flew down the stairs. Brooke and I followed close behind. I was gasping for breath as Dad pulled open the front door. I stared at two black uniformed police officers. They stood on the front stoop with a boy I'd never seen before. Mom let out a cry. Her eyes bulged as she stared at the boy. He was tall and athletic looking, with curly brown hair, green eyes, and freckles on his cheeks. You're not Sam, she yelled. I told them, the boy said. My name is Jerome. He rolled his eyes. How come no one ever believes kids? This isn't your son? One of the officers asked. Mom and Dad shook their heads. Where do you live? The officer asked. On Brentwood, Jerome said, near the old library. My bike had a flat tire, and I was trying to walk home. That's when you stopped me. Take Jerome home, the officer told his partner. Sorry, son. He turned to my parents. I'm Officer Rawls. I'm real sorry about the mix-up. Let's go inside and straighten this out. So we all trooped into the living room. The four of us sat on the edge of the couch. Officer Rawls leaned against the mantelpiece and took notes on a little pad. Brooke began her story, but before she could get very far, the door opened and Taylor stepped into the room. I'm back from Patsy's, she called. Then she saw the police officer and stopped with a gasp. What's up? Sam is missing, Mom told her. Come here, sit down with me. Brooke is going to tell the officer what happened. So Brooke told her story all over again. By the time she finished, Officer Rawls had his cap off. He was scratching his short brown hair and blinking his eyes a lot. Taylor walked over to Brooke. Hello, she said. Are you and Sam playing a practical joke on us? As I said, our whole family likes to play jokes. Except for Mom, of course. So naturally, that's the first thing Taylor thought. It's not a joke, Brooke whispered. Tears rolled down her cheeks again. Really? Not a joke? Taylor went pale. Her mouth dropped open. She stared hard at Brooke. Officer Rawls placed his cap back on his head. He glanced at the little notepad in his hand. Then he turned back to Brooke. Brooke, please listen to me he said softly. I want you to think long and hard about this. You can see how upset Sam's family is. I want you to think about what happened up in Robbie's room, and then tell it one more time. Brooke let out a long sigh. Then she began telling her story again. I couldn't sit still. I felt sick. My stomach was bubbling and churning. I kept picturing that open window, and I kept seeing my little brother's pudgy, smiling face. Would I ever see him again? I wandered into the den. I heard voices. The TV was on. A talk show my mom likes. It stars this big man with bright red hair that stands straight up on his head. Red Martinson. I hate Red Martinson. He laughs at his own jokes. He thinks he's a real riot. Mom thinks he's cute. I reach for the remote to turn off the TV. So tell me, Martinson was saying to a guest, how do you feel about things now? I let out a sharp cry when I saw the guest. The remote fell from my hand. I, I can't believe it, I gasped. I was staring at the purple rage. Red Martinson's guest was my comic character, the purple rage. How do I feel about things? The rage boomed. I'm angry! Know what really pinches my piano? Everything! I'm angry about everything! His face turned as purple as his costume. His eyes were red and looked like they were about to pop out of his head. I'm angry! 
he shouted and thumped his big fist on Red Martinson's desk. Most of our viewers won't believe you're real, Martinson said. Do something super to prove you're the real deal. That burns my bubble blower, the rage screamed. That makes me even angrier! How could I be on TV if I'm not real? Then his face turned an even darker purple. Only a supervillain could turn that purple. I gaped at the screen in disbelief. The rage? Real? How could that be? Mom and Dad have got to see this. Breathless, I spun away from the TV. I ran back into the living room. Brooke was still telling her story. Officer Rawls was writing in his little pad. I ran up to Mom and Dad. Hurry! I screamed. In the other room, on TV! I pulled them toward the den. It's my other comic character! I cried. You'll see! It's the Purple Rage! For real! They followed me into the den. I pointed to the TV. So, what plans do you have for the future? Red Martinson was asking. I'm glad you asked that question, the guest replied. Huh? My mouth dropped open. Where did the purple rage go? The guest was a white-haired man in a gray suit with a red necktie. That's Congressman McClue, Dad said. Robbie, why did you pull us in here to see Congressman McClue? Chapter 9 my whole body was shaking. I stared at the screen. How could the purple rage disappear like that? Mom rested her hand on my shoulder. Robbie, we know how upset you are, she said softly. We know how much you care about your brother, but don't make it worse by making up crazy stories. But, 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 I sputtered. My brain was spinning. I couldn't speak. Officer Rawls said he had to leave. He told us all to stick around. He said he would send his crime scene people to study the yard and the whole house. He promised he'd come back. Mom and Dad went to Taylor's room to comfort her. I pulled Brooke aside. No one believes me, Brooke said, her voice cracking. No one believes me either, I said. But I know I'm not crazy. The purple rage was on TV. I saw him. Brooke shook her head. Maybe we are crazy. I mean, comic characters coming to life? I started to the front door. Are you coming with me? I asked. She held back. Huh? Where? To the TV station, I said. The rage might still be there. Huh? The TV station? Robbie, do you know where it is? Yes, I said. Remember? Our school went there last year to be on that kid's show? I pulled open the front door. Bright sunlight poured over me. Are you coming or not? I asked Brooke. She thought for a few seconds, biting her bottom lip. Okay, she said. Let's go. We took a bus to the Middle Meadows Mall. The WSTR TV station was in a big green glass building behind the mall. Brooke and I stepped up to the green glass door at the front. I pushed the bell. The door buzzed. I pulled it open and we walked into the reception area. A blonde haired woman with bright orange lipstick sat behind the front desk. She wore a black business suit with a crisp white blouse. She had a sparkly starfish pin on her jacket. WSTR is the starfish station. Don't ask me why. My throat felt tight as I hurried up to her desk, and my hands were sweaty. I tried to brush down my wild and woolly hair to look more businesslike. Can we see Red Martinson? I asked. She studied me, then Brooke. Do you have an appointment? She asked. I shook my head. No, but it's really important, I said. We just want to ask him one question, Brooke said. Are you with your school newspaper? The woman asked. She tapped a pencil on her desk. Uh, yes, I lied. We want to interview Mr. Martinson for our paper. Well, you need an appointment for that, the woman replied. But, I started, 
I... Was the Purple Rage here? Brooke asked. We just want to know if the Purple Rage was on his show. The woman stopped tapping her pencil. She took a clipboard and ran her eyes down the top page. Is he a chef? You might want to try the cooking show. I let out a sigh. Oh, you don't understand, I said. He isn't a chef. He's a supervillain. I thought I made him up, but I saw him on TV, so maybe he's real. And if he's real... She squinted at me. Are you making any sense? I don't think so. I heard someone coming down the metal stairway right behind the reception desk. Hey! I cried as Red Martinson stepped out. He wasn't dressed like he was on his show. He wore jeans and a black and red t-shirt that said Cleveland Rocks. His red hair still stood straight up like an evergreen tree on his head. He waved to the receptionist and started to the front door. But then he suddenly stopped and turned around to face us. Hey, I like your hairstyle, kid, he said to me. He laughed. Are you copying me? Yes, I blurted out. I, I mean, no. Mr. Martinson, we came to see you. Sorry, he said. I left my autographed photos up in the dressing room. Can you come back? I'm in a rush. He pulled open the front door. Brooke hurried after him. She grabbed his arm. Was the Purple Rage just on your show? She asked. Martinson nodded. Yes, he said. At first I thought it was a joke, but he proved he was really a supervillain, so I put him on the show. Did you enjoy my interview? My heart started to pound. Where is he? I cried. Is he still here? Where did he go? Martinson shrugged. He had to fly somewhere, he said. He went up to the roof to take off. I didn't wait. I spun around and ran. I brushed past the startled receptionist. I grabbed the metal banister and began running up the winding staircase. Stop! She screamed. Hey, stop! You can't go up there! My shoes clanged on the metal stairs. I heard Brooke running right behind me. Where were we headed? Could we get to the roof from here? Was the Purple Rage still up there? Stop! The receptionist screamed. Security! Security! Stop them! Chapter 10 I reached the second floor and kept climbing. The stairway straightened out. The stairs were concrete up here. I could hear the heavy thuds of men's shoes behind us, coming up fast. Stop! A man yelled. Security! Stop right there! Their angry voices echoed in the narrow hallway. My chest felt about to explode. My legs ached, but I kept climbing, taking the stairs two at a time. The third floor went by, and then the fourth. Gasping for breath, I glanced back. Brooke? No, not there. She had been right behind me. Did one of those security guards grab her? Brooke! I shouted. Brooke! My cries echoed down the stairwell. No reply. My legs felt like heavy weights. My chest and side throbbed with pain, but I kept pulling myself up the steps. Stop now! You can't get away! Stop running! The voices boomed close behind me. Finally, I reached the top of the stairs. A broad yellow door stood at the end. I lowered my shoulder, heaved, and shoved it open. With a gasp, I stumbled out into bright sunlight. I fell onto the flat tar papered roof, landed hard on my knees. Blinking in the light, I saw a blur of purple. Just a brief flash, a one second glimpse of a purple cape. Wait! I choked out, but my voice creaked out in a whisper. The purple rage. It had to be him. I jumped to my feet and staggered to the edge of the roof. Wait! I screamed, a little louder this time. I stumbled to the edge of the roof, leaned over the side to see the purple rage. Whoa! I leaned too far. It happened so fast. One second I was leaning out over the edge, and the next second the roof seemed to slide out from under my feet, and I was falling! Chapter 11 The building soared past me in a gray blur. The powerful rush of the wind chilled my back. 
I fell so fast I couldn't hear my own scream. Down, down in a bright blur. No time to ready myself for the crash and the burst of pain that would end my life. And then, thud! I hit hard. Pain shot through my arms, my neck, my back. My head bounced up. The sky appeared to wrap itself around me like a blue blanket. No, purple. A purple blanket gripping me tightly. And then a red face with a grim, tight-lipped expression. Huh? It took me a moment to realize that I hadn't hit the ground. I was still in the air, held up in the air by the purple rage. Yes, one arm under my legs, the other under my shoulders, lifting me to the sky. His cape was fluttering noisily in the wind. His dark eyes gazed straight ahead, then down as we started to descend. His powerful arms held me tightly against his massive purple chest. The purple rage had swooped up and rescued me. He floated to the sidewalk, cape fluttering behind him. He set me gently on my feet. I was shaking so hard, I dropped to my knees. I knew my hair was standing straight up, wild around my face. I swallowed again and again, struggling to catch my breath. The rage pulled me to my feet. He held me up by my shoulders. His eyes burned into mine. Know what paddles my pancakes? He boomed. His voice was so loud and deep, it made pigeons squawk and fly off the sidewalk. Kids who fall off buildings, that puts me in a rage! Sorry, I stammered. Were you chasing me? He bellowed. No, I choked out. My heart was still hammering in my chest. Not exactly. I stared back at him. Was I dreaming this? This wasn't a comic strip. This was real life. But there he was, in front of me. His purple gloves held me by the shoulders. His eyes glared at me angrily. A character I created. I... I need your help, I said, finally finding my voice. My brother Sam is missing. I think Dr. Maniac took him. The purple rage tossed back his head and uttered an angry roar. His eyes blazed red like fire, and he curled his hands into big fists. I swore, enemy! He roared. You say your brother has teamed up with my sworn enemy? No, uh, that's not what I said, I replied. But he roared like a furious beast again and drowned out my words. Listen to me, I begged. But he lifted himself off the ground. He spun around and kicked a store window with the toe of his purple boot. I ducked as the glass shattered and flew everywhere. The rage kicked out a few more store windows. Then he turned back to me, his big chest heaving. How could your brother team up with that maniac? He screamed. I heard that Dr. Maniac teamed up with a Scarlet Starlet. I, I don't know, I stammered, backing away. The Scarlet Starlet? I drew her in my very first comic strip. Was she real too? I took a deep breath. Are you going to help me? I asked. That sent him into another rage. His face turned as purple as his costume. He grabbed the front of my shirt and lifted me off the sidewalk. Dr. Maniac sent you to spy on me, didn't he? He boomed. His hot breath burned my eyebrows. No, no, I said. Liar! He screamed. He gazed up to the top of the building. Wonder if I could toss you back up to the roof? He said. No, please! I begged. His fist tightened on the front of my t-shirt. He raised me above his head. Please, I only want your help! I wailed. Don't throw me! Don't! I glanced around. Wasn't there anyone around to help me? No, the street was empty. Looking for your friend, Dr. Maniac? 
the rage cried. Sorry, kid. He's too late to save you. He pulled back his arm and heaved me with all his strength. No! I screamed again as I went flying up to the sky. Chapter 12 My scream caught in my throat. I couldn't breathe. The wind rushed too hard against my face. I sailed straight up, my arms and legs thrashing. I shut my eyes and slammed hard into the side of the building. Thud! My breath shot out in a whoosh. Pain swept over my chest. I choked and gasped for air. I kept my eyes shut and waited to die. I counted to myself. One, two, three. On three, I felt another hard thud. I opened my eyes and saw the red-faced supervillain staring at me. The purple rage had caught me. He saved me again. As he flew, he held me in front of him like a loaf of bread. Change my mind, kid, he shouted. But it was good to see the old arm is still in shape. I could probably throw you to the next town. Uh, you're not going to, are you? I asked. He floated to the ground and set me down again. I bent over, grabbed my knees, and waited for my breathing to return to normal. I tried to brush down my hair with both hands, but it sprang right back up. After today's adventures, I knew it would probably never come back down. Does this mean you'll help me find my brother? I asked. The Purple Rage nodded. I will make it my mission. I cannot leave him in the hands of my sworn enemy. Awesome, I said. Yes, I am awesome, he declared, sticking out his big chest. Do you know what really snaps my shorts? When other people tell me how awesome I am, because I already know it! He grabbed a lamppost and bent it in two. Sorry, I murmured. This... this is all so totally weird. He squinted at me. Weird? Yes, I said. Do you know that I created you? No! The rage bellowed furiously. You liar! I was created by a scream from the mouth of the ancient god Thor! Before I could move, he grabbed me up with both hands, holding me in front of him. He took off! The wind blew against my face. Behind me, I could hear his purple cape snapping against the air. He soared higher, above the cars, above the buildings. Where are we going? I screamed into the wind. What are you doing? We flew toward the sun, into blinding white light. I shielded my eyes with one hand. I tried not to look down, but I couldn't help it. Far below us, a freight train rolled by on the North Hills tracks. It looked like one of those toy trains people set up in their basements. The buildings all looked like dollhouses. Please, I begged. Why was he so angry? What did I say to put him in such a rage? Then I remembered. He was always in a rage. We neared the edge of town, and he suddenly swooped lower. A building came into view, hidden by tall evergreen trees. It was a round stone building, shaped like an igloo. No windows, a low door in the front. The building was completely surrounded by trees. Was it his hidden fortress? I hadn't created a hidden fortress for him. I hadn't created any of this. It was all happening without me. Beyond my control. We dropped lower. I ducked my head as the purple rage roared into the open door. It was like a huge, dark cave inside. We flew down, down. The air felt heavy and wet. I blinked hard, waiting for my eyes to adjust. He dropped me onto my feet. I watched his cape settle behind him. He swept back his dark hair with both gloved hands. Then he pulled off the gloves and tossed them against the wall. No one really tweaks my tutu! 
he shouted. Dead leaves in my hair! How am I supposed to fly with leaves in my perfect hair? Don't know, I muttered. Where are we? I asked in a tiny voice. He didn't answer. He moved to the wall and began clicking on lights. I glanced around. We stood in a large underground cavern. The walls were solid stone. The room was filled with camera equipment and spotlights. I saw a table filled with computers. Two TV cameras stood side by side next to a microphone on a long pole. Is this like a TV studio? I asked. The Rage didn't answer. He was busy fiddling with the computers. He typed frantically on one keyboard, then moved to another. Then he pointed a TV camera at a glass case against the wall. Something moved inside the big case. I walked over to it and gazed through the glass. Dozens of dark, spiny creatures crawled all over each other. What are those? I asked, pointing. Scorpions! The Purple Rage answered. You keep a huge glass case filled with scorpions? My voice came out shrill and tight. But what do you do with them? You'll see, he murmured. He began moving lights toward the case. I watched the scorpions sliding, crawling, scraping, snapping their claws at each other. They look hungry, I said. A strange, unpleasant smile spread over his face. I'm going to feed them in a minute, he said. What do you feed them? I asked. He tossed back his head and laughed. You! He said. Chapter 13 But, but, I sputtered. You said you were going to help me find Sam. He turned some dials on a big control board. Red lights flickered. Machines started to hum. I shall keep my promise, he said. He turned to me. No one really hawks my horse! No? What? I said, unable to take my eyes off the scrabbling, snapping scorpions. People who get tense about me keeping my promises! He screamed. He pulled his arm back and smashed his fist into the wall. The wall cracked. Muttering to himself, he dusted off his hands. Then he strode over picked me up and set me down in front of a TV camera. Stand there, kid. Don't move, he said. No problem, I whispered. What are you going to do? He punched more keys on the computers. I'm going to interrupt all TV channels and websites in the city, he said. Everyone will have the pleasure of watching the world's best-looking supervillain, me! I didn't say a word. I didn't want to make him smash the wall again. I just wondered if he really planned to help me find Sam. He stepped behind the camera and raised the lens a few inches. Then he moved in front of it. He stuck out his chest, swept back his cape, and cleared his throat. Hello, everyone. I am the Purple Rage, he announced. He motioned to me. And this is a kid named... He thought hard, gazing into the camera. Then he turned to me. What's your name, kid? Robbie Schwartz, I said. He waved a fist at me. Is your dad Bucky Schwartz, the guy who owns the dry cleaners on Spring Street? Last time I brought my tights in, he shrunk them! No, uh, my dad's Norman Schwartz, I said. He's a lawyer. The rage turned back to the TV camera. Sorry to interrupt your day, everyone, he said. But I want you to watch me as I drop Robbie into a seven-foot-tall case of stinging scorpions. Huh? I gasped. This is your plan for helping me? He moved his face up close to the camera lens. Let this be a warning to Dr. Maniac! He boomed. And to anyone else who dares to challenge the Purple Rage! Then he grabbed me under the arms and lifted me off the ground. Whoa, wait! I cried. 
What about your promise? Is this your plan to help me find my brother? Of course, he said. When your brother sees you're about to be stung to death by these scorpions, don't you think he'll escape from Dr. Maniac and come to rescue you? Uh, maybe there's a better plan, I cried. The rage didn't reply. Instead, he raised me high above his head and tossed me into the glass case. Chapter 14 I landed in a sitting position. Scorpion shells squished and crackled under me. Before I could move, scorpions rolled their shiny dark shells over my legs. The creatures never stopped moving. They felt warm and dry and prickly against my skin. I struggled to stand, but I slid and slipped on the wriggling hard bodies. I cried out as a scorpion scrabbled over my waist. I tried to swat it off me, lost my balance, and fell onto my back. As soon as I was down, they swarmed over me. Their shells clacked and bumped as they covered me. Pincers swiped the air, snapping wildly. Oh, help! I muttered. And then I remembered two words that sent a cold shudder down my body. Scorpions sting! Yes, one sting from a poisonous scorpion could kill. So far, they were climbing over me, covering me, crawling and snapping. One sting, just one. Carefully pulling a scorpion off my chest, I struggled to my knees. I pressed my hands against the front of the glass case. On the other side of the glass, I could see the purple rage. He stood in front of the TV camera. He kept pounding his chest with his fists, talking away. Get me out of here! I shouted, but the glass muffled my voice. He didn't seem to hear or care. Why didn't I create some heroes? I asked myself. Why did I only create villains? Ow! I pulled a prickly scorpion out from under the back of my t-shirt. Two scorpion pincers snapped at my arms. All around me, it sounded like scissors snapping, snapping, snapping. One sting, and I was dead meat. Even if Sam was watching this somewhere on TV, even if he was somehow able to escape from the clutches of Dr. Maniac and come to my rescue, he'd be too late. I knew I had to break out of the case. The purple rage wasn't going to help me. I had to escape on my own. But how? I beat my fists against the glass. No! No way I could break it with my hands. Maybe if I lowered my shoulder and rammed the glass with it. No way I could get any speed. I was knee-deep in scorpions. Maybe if I dropped onto my back and kicked the glass. No. I couldn't kick it hard enough to break it. Scorpions wrapped around my waist. A pincer reached up and snapped at my neck. Missed me by an inch. How could I escape? How? Suddenly, I had an idea. A frantic, desperate idea. My only chance. Chapter 15 I batted away a snapping scorpion. I struggled to my knees. Then I gathered up all my strength reached both hands up and jumped as high as I could. I grabbed the top of the case. It was seven feet tall, above my head. No way I could climb out. But I pulled my head up above the edge and I shouted to the purple rage, you geek, you cream puff, you wimp. He went on talking into the camera. He thumped his chest and talked about how angry he was. You dumb creep. I shouted, you fat wimp! That got his attention. He turned to me. What did you say? You baby, you worm, I screamed. You're no match for the incredible Dr. Maniac. He stomped up to the case. His eyes flamed red and his face turned deep purple. No one crunches my credenza! He boomed. You do! How dare you! You're pitiful, I cried, hoisting myself up to the top of the case. You're dirt. You're roadkill. His eyes bulged. His mouth flew open. His nostrils flared. 
and his teeth began to chatter. I waited for his head to explode. Instead, he let out a roar. Face the power of my breath of fury! He boomed. The purple rage sucked in a deep breath. So deep, his chest popped out like a beach ball. And then, he blew his breath of fury. A hurricane force wind at the case. The glass shattered and shards crashed and clattered in all directions. Scorpions went sailing out of the cage and flew to the wall, flailing their pincers. The force of his breath made me do a backward somersault. I toppled out of the cage onto the floor. It took me a few seconds to gain my balance. Then I spun to my feet. My escape plan had worked. I was out of the case. But now, I really had to escape. Snarling like an angry dog, the purple rage dove for me. With a cry, I grabbed two scorpions. I heaved them at him and took off running. He let out a roar. I felt his breath of fury on my back. It pushed me out the door into a long underground hallway. The hall was lined on both sides by big color photos of the purple rage. As I ran past them, his face stared out angrily in picture after picture. I heard his thudding footsteps behind me, catching up fast. This really grinds my goatee! He bellowed. Come back, kid! I'm only trying to help you! Help me? Help me feed his scorpions? I reached the door at the end of the hall, twisted the knob, and shoved it open. It led into a wide dressing room. As I ran through it, I saw open closets on both sides. Hanging in the closets dangled pair after pair of purple tights and bodysuits. A small closet at the end was piled high with purple boots. The rage thundered after me. I grabbed a handful of boots and tossed them into his path. He stomped over them and kept coming, screaming and snarling. I found another hallway and ran faster. A dark wooden door stood at the end of the hall. Gasping for breath, I flung the door open and stepped through. My feet kicked. Air! Nothing beneath them! No floor! No ground! Whoa! I let out a startled cry. My hands flew above my head as I dropped straight down. I dropped hard into a deep darkness and landed with a splash. Icy water rose over me. I held my breath as I sank into it. A sewer. It didn't take long to figure out I had dropped into a deep, fast-flowing sewer. The sewer water was thick and lumpy, like cold pea soup. I thrashed my arms and legs and struggled to stay afloat. My hands splashed against chunks of rotten garbage. Ugh! It smelled like weak old vomit. I started to choke and gag. I reached for the sewer wall with both hands, but the current swept me up and pulled me away. Was that a dead rat floating beside me? No, only a rat's head. My stomach lurched. The current pulled harder, carrying me into darkness. I crashed against the sewer wall, bounced off, tried to kick away, crashed again. The putrid, disgusting water splashed over my head. I felt myself sink under the surface. I tried to pull myself up, but panic froze my body. I couldn't think, couldn't move. My chest throbbed, couldn't breathe. Drowning. I'm going to drown, I realized. Drown in this putrid, swirling gunk. Chapter 16. Finally, I got my legs moving. I kicked hard and rose to the surface, sputtering and gasping, shaking the thick, gloppy sewage from my eyes. I spotted something up ahead, something jutting from the sewer wall. A ladder? Yes, a ladder! I could see it glowing in a beam of yellow sunlight. A way out! I held my breath as the current carried me closer, closer. I made a desperate grab for it. Missed! Grabbed again! This time, I caught the second rung. Holding on with both hands, I pulled my body up from the water. Yes! Yes! My cries were hoarse and weak. 
My shoes slid off the slimy metal rungs. I held on with both hands, gasping for breath. I lifted myself out, rung by rung. It seemed to take forever. My body felt like it weighed a thousand pounds. Finally, I reached the top. I hoisted myself through a sewer grate and onto the street. I pressed my hands on my knees and struggled to catch my breath. Water rolled off me. My wet t-shirt clung to my skin. I pulled a pukey brown blob of goo out of my tangled matted hair. I smelled as if I'd been sprayed by a hundred skunks. Wiping sewage off my face, I pushed my hair back and gazed around. The street sign on the corner read, Wayne Street. Hey! I uttered a cry. I was only two blocks from home. I didn't have the strength to run, so I half walked, half dragged myself across the front lawns all the way to my house. As I trudged up the driveway, I thought about Brooke. She probably escaped those security guards, I decided. She's probably safe at home by now. The front door swung open as I limped up the front walk. Mom stepped out, her dark eyes wide with surprise. Robbie! She cried. Where were you? She studied me up and down. Then she pressed her hands against her cheeks. Oh my, she murmured. Have you been swimming? Uh, no, I choked out. It's a long story. I... Robbie, you stink to high heaven, she cried. Why did you run away? What on earth have you been doing? I wanted to tell her everything, but she didn't give me a chance. She grabbed me by my hair and tugged me into the house. Go upstairs, she ordered. Take off those disgusting wet clothes. Take a shower. No, take two showers. You reek. I've never smelled anything so bad in all my life. I... I can explain, I choked out. Mom, some very weird stuff happened to me today. Not now, she said. Go take a shower first. I can't believe you wandered off with your brother Sam missing. But... The phone rang. Mom hurried across the room to answer it. She began talking softly. After a few seconds, she turned pale. Her shoulders slumped. She shook her head. Mom, what is it? I asked, hurrying over to her. What's wrong? She set down the phone. I don't believe it, she murmured. What? I cried. What happened? That was Brooke's mom, she said. Brooke is missing too.